brothers and sisters, sisters in the risen, crucified and risen, and ascended and glorious Lord Jesus Christ, who has revealed his word to us for our benefit, grace and peace to you. Ignorance isn't usually our issue. Feels nice to say that in some ways. That's, that's not usually our problem. If you find yourself saying, I wonder if I should be here right now doing this, the answer is almost always no. <laughs> if you have to ask, probably not. You, you, you've got some, some sense, and that's, that's uh, uh, true for all of us. Most of the time when we have a, a bit of silence for private confession, for times that you can remember breaking God's law in the past days or week, usually you can think of something. Usually a few examples come right, right out because you're aware of that, that that was not God's will for your life. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out, to know what God's will is not. You just need to have some basic idea of what God's will for you is. And you do. You do because you're, you're sitting here, you've studied this, you've heard this before, um, and, and, and you do. But remember, in this series, we're, we're going back, looking at everything through fresh eyes, as though it were the first time we were hearing about God's Ten Commandments. The first time sitting in a Lutheran church, hearing how those commandments are supposed to be used. So we'll study them here, like I mentioned, over the next couple of weeks. They're, they're a good summary of God's will. You could hardly find a more succinct, to the point summary, straight from God's lips of his will. But note that it's his will for a particular group of people, for a specific time and place. More important to you is what Jesus says about each of those ten commandments and how he applies them to you. I'll repeat that because it's, it's really important that we don't just read the Ten Commandments out of Exodus 20 and the other chapters around Ex Exodus 20 and apply it all to us and say, this must be God's will also for me. Because God's will for Abraham and his descendants is not the same as his will for you in many ways. For example, God told the Israelites to gather three times a year, at a particular place. On Mount Sinai, he hadn't even told him what place. Later he explained, I mean Jerusalem. To go there, to that spot physically, and worship him three times a year. Is that God's will for your life? No. You can spend your whole life worshiping the Lord in Menasha, even in Nina, and you could still be doing God's will exactly how he has it planned for you because that, that part of his will, his laws for those people at that time isn't the same as his will for you at this time. That's important to keep clear. Jesus himself uh, clarified that. When we read in John, that he's, uh, in, in John that he sat next to a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, not even an Israelite, he got to talking about where to worship and his plan for that, for, for, for that occasion, those three times a year. Should it be here? Should it be there? Remember what Jesus said? Time is coming, and it's in fact now here, when God's true worshipers worship him in spirit and in truth. Doesn't care, he doesn't care about which mountain you're talking about. Worship him in spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and in truth, exactly the way his word speaks it. When Jesus said it is finished, things changed. His will for, for lookers to the Messiah, followers of the Messiah, who has now come and completed his work, it's different in this time after Christ than before. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, don't let people judge you and try to hold you to what God's will was for people, um, not long ago, but people before Jesus came. Uh, Colossians 2 describes festivals and feasts 
and worshiping in particular places as shadows of things that were to come. And says the reality is found in Christ. Don't let people hold up shadows and pictures and symbols to you and say, that's God's will for you and you need to do that that way. In Christian freedom, we look to Christ and hear what he has to say. And that's where we determine his will for our lives. We listen to what God's will is for you now. If you come to me wondering what God's will is for you about something, that's what we'll do. We'll look and see what Jesus has said to you. Jesus did repeat many of the same commandments that he did in Exodus, the Ten Commandments that are so famous. Um, Jesus went down, down the list and let you know that just because he has now come, it doesn't mean murdering and stealing are now okay. He kept those for you. Those still stand and that's still his will, that you not murder, that you not steal. In fact, as you listen to Jesus teach, it becomes clear his definitions of murdering and stealing are much more specific and much more restrictive on you than any other passage from the Old Testament. But we'll talk about those next week. For, for this week, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the, what they call the first table or tablet of the law. Um, I'm not sure if that's how it worked when Moses was carrying the stone tablets that God had carved the Ten Commandments into down Mount Sinai, whether he had love for God, commandments 1 through 3 on this side, and love for neighbor, commandments 4 through 10 on this side. Or whether it was an even 5 and 5. I don't know. What, what, it's, just, it's just a nickname. But what is clear as you look at these first three commandments today is that you have, you have a God who really loves you. You have a God who wants you to be close to him. You have a God who wants to stay in a relationship with you. And you have a God who wants to live at peace with you. Let's look at the first commandment. I, I have it printed in, on uh, page 4 of your worship folder in full Old Testament form. It's a lot of words. It's verses 1 through 6 of Exodus chapter 20. The short form of it that you might have memorized or heard in other places is, is in that second line there. You shall have no other gods. The other summary that you might have learned of the first commandment is, is from when Jesus was asked by someone, what's the biggest, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's Matthew 22. That's the first and greatest commandment commandment, he said. Those are, those are both little summaries of what God was commanding in his first commandment. And in either way you slice it, God's will for you is that you rank him number one. That's called an exclusive relationship. Someone's number one, everyone else is not number one. Have you heard about an open relationship? Better, have you heard about an open relationship that works and lasts and is healthy for everyone involved? No, you haven't because it, it doesn't work like that. This is an exclusive relationship. It's like a, a marriage. Uh, our hearts automatically rank. You can't get away from it. We're always, always doing that. Our schedules and our budgets also rank. And uh, it's called prioritizing. It's something we just can't ever turn off. It's, it's what God wants and what God commands here. That if something always has to be number one in your life, that he is that number one. That God be your only God. That God be your only Savior. That the Lord, the triune God of the Bible, be your only hope for eternal life with no other fallbacks, no prayers to anyone else, no other saviors, no other gods. Now, if I walked up to a family yesterday at Latino Fest and said, I want you to put me first in your life, they'd look at me like I was from Mars. They'd say, first of all, no. 
Second, who are you? Third, go away from us. This is, this is weird. We don't want to talk to you. When the Lord phrased this commandment for the Israelites, he began by reminding them of something very important, very near and dear to them. In the first sentence, he spoke to them. I'm the Lord, not just I'm the Lord God, I am the Lord your God. And you remember what I've done for you, don't, don't you? The Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. As if to say, ah, you know me. Think about where you would have been without me or if you had someone else as your God. I deserve first place in your life. That's the way Jesus, that's the way our, our God introduces these, these, these Ten Commandments with that statement. Here's why. First of all, here's why. Because I've saved you. Here's my will for you. And he was right. He did deserve first place in their life. But how about for you? God hasn't rescued you from slavery in Egypt. I haven't heard that in any of your biographies. He hasn't promised you descendants as numerous as the stars or as the sand. So why should you? Why would you rank God number one as he commands in this commandment? I would love to hear your, your personal answer, your, your reason, why, why God rises to number one in your life, what he's done for you. I think the, the answers would be as beautiful and as varied as there are people sitting here today. One Christian said it this way, he who didn't spare his only son, but gave him up for us all graciously, I know he'll give me... A, all sorts of other things, too, because that was the most important. I'm sure your answer would be something along those lines. If somebody else, anybody else, had gone to the trouble, gone to the stress and the pain, had gone to the cross to redeem you from all of your sins and then hand you salvation as a gift, you could turn to that person. And that person could, could ask of you for your allegiance. They could demand it of you and say, I, I deserve that from you. Anybody else who had done that for you. But where else are we going to turn? Who else has done anything like that for us? No one. There's no other name under heaven given to us by which we can be saved. Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. You see Jesus and, and you see a God who loved you first with all of his heart and soul and mind. Isn't that what it took for him to carry through on his mission? To come into this world? To live perfectly? To be crucified? To die? To be buried? It's love, first and foremost, for you. A love that ranked you first. There's why. He gave up his life and he shed his blood his heart, soul, mind, strength, yes, his, his body, his blood, his energy, his time, everything for you willingly because you needed it. And, 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 and that's, that's why you turn to him and say, I, I willingly put you first too. I've seen what you've done for me and, and, and you need to be first. You deserve it, Lord. You can be at peace knowing that you have a God like this. Knowing that this is how he's, he's treated you. You can look at, at that will of God for you, that you rank him first, and then you can hold it up and compare it against your, your heart. Compare it against your, 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 yourself, your, your life, your priorities in other areas. Where is your, your future? If, 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 if with the Lord isn't the first answer, you've got to make some arrangements for that. Where is your confidence? Where is your knowledge that you have peace with God? Where is your self-confidence? Where are your priorities? Is it in the Lord or some other God? And how can you bring that in line with what God says his will is for you? I'll let you in on a secret. 
when you sin against any of the commandments, you break any of God's other laws, it's first and foremost a first commandment issue. And if you, if you covet, if you steal or lie, whatever it may be, a, a, a adultery or disrespect, any of them, come back to this. You have not prioritized God first. If you had, you, you wouldn't have done these things against his will. So you break the fourth commandment, you also break the first. You break any of the others, you also break the first. But here is another secret. And one that God wants you to hear because it's painted on all the pages of the Bible. It's that for each time that any of those Ten Commandments cuts into your heart and you realize, what have I done? I am worthy of death. I am worthy of condemnation and God's anger forever. There is one person who applies a healing touch to you and who can cure that cut. It's the one who is pierced for your transgressions and crushed for your iniquities. It's the punishment that brought you peace. It was on Jesus. By his wounds, you are healed. It's the same Jesus who said to another busted, crushed sinner, very aware of their guilt against commandments. He said to her, seems like nobody else here has the power to condemn you. I don't condemn you either. Now go and leave your life of sin. That was his will for her life. And it's his will for yours too. The second and third commandments are not surprises. They're printed for you here on the next page. You can look at them and study them. They're both in old, full Old Testament form there and then also in Jesus' rewording for people like us. We're not going to look at them in depth. It's enough to say with something that sounds very obvious. If the first commandment is first, well, the second and third follow very naturally after it. You see and you appreciate what God has done for you, how he put you first, and it makes sense for you then that as a Christian, as an ambassador for Christ who carries around his name, that you respect the name of your God. Even if everyone else in the world misuses it, even if you yourself got into a bad habit at some point of, of treating God's name with something less than respect, the name of Jesus, the name of Christ, well, here's, here's God's will for you. Jesus said just stick with yes or no or you could add ouch or rats. Save the name of your Savior for praying and praising and giving thanks and telling other people about the great God who saved you from your sins. Save it for that special purpose. And the third commandment also, it makes sense. I rarely recite the third commandment to somebody that I haven't seen at church for a time. You know why? Because I don't, I don't need to. They usually beat me to it. They see my number and they answer the phone with, I know, I know, Pastor, I know. <laughs> I haven't even said anything yet. But they know God's will is that they gather around his word, that they be supported by you, that they receive the prayers of fellow saints, and that their faith is fed a steady diet of God's words. This is the only the spiritual nourishment that keeps us going when we have weeks like we do, when we have days like you do. For you who are in God's house here today and clearly have put worshiping God ahead of um, worshiping your, I don't know, your mattress or your video games or your work or something, here's, here's God's will for you. When Jesus says, come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself. Learn from me. Those aren't really things with an end date on them. Nor are they really things where you can say, all right, I've accomplished this and now I can move on to other things. I've, I've matured enough. No, there's always more to learn from Christ. There's always another yoke to bear as a Christian. There's always more following after Jesus, day after day. Come to him and keep coming to him to hear the words of eternal life. Keep learning from Jesus and resting your weary bones in these pews so that you have energy to take up your yoke of Christianity and grind forward. Maybe it'll have to be in a low gear 
this week. Most importantly, entrust your weary soul to the one person who kept this third commandment and the second and the first and all ten of the commandments, both in letter and in spirit. He kept them perfectly, and he, he's the one who gifted you a salvation you never could have earned with a lifetime of trying so hard to keep them. He just gave it to you. Rank him first, respect his name, and rest in him. Rest comfortably, aware of the grace of God toward you. Rest gladly, knowing that he has forgiven you of all your sins against these and any other commandments. Rest joyfully. Rest excitedly, knowing that you are ready for another day, another week, of following God's will. Amen. I'll ask the Sunday school teachers to stand up, please, wherever you are. You don't need to come up to the front. Just 